Welcome to Yoga For You, a channel tailored to helping you discover your very own unique yoga practice. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sagacity Spotlight. Today's guest is the lovely Melissa. In this talk, we're going to discuss what it's like to move through a divorce with yoga, teaching through a pandemic, yoga philosophy one-on-one, -on -one, and the importance of being present. Hope you enjoy this. Stick around to the end, and please comment anything below that you'd like to share. Namaste. Okay. Hello, hello. Welcome. Today I'm being joined with the lovely Melissa and we're going to be discussing fun things, yoga, and what it means to live a human life um, in this yoga world, in this modern time. So welcome. Melissa, how are you Thank doing today? Thank you. Good, thanks. How are you? I am doing well. Happy to be here with you and sharing this space. And there's some sunshine in my face, so that's always nice awesome. to, to have happening. A hundred percent. Yeah, here... So it's mid-March in Michigan, and it's actually in the mid-60s. So that's like an amazing gift. Wow, that is nice and warm, huh? It's it almost, is. It's almost swimming weather, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, why not? The ice is melted, so go for oh, it. There you go. <laughs> that's awesome. Do you ever do those ice plunges, the uh, polar plunges or anything like that? No, the closest that I get is I will like get in the water early in this, like before Memorial Day, which here is early in the season and the water might be in like the 60s. It's still pretty cold, but it's also I know, like... that's why it's like for, <laughs> for people outside of Michigan, it's like, well, and even some people here are like, I'm not getting in that. What's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> it, it helps if the air is super hot though. And you right? jump in for a refreshment and you jump back out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, I am very happy to be having this discussion. I just kind of want to open up and uh, ask you what yoga means to you. Very generic question, but I figure it's a great yeah. place to start. Absolutely. So it's interesting. I actually was studying philosophy with um, the studio that I study philosophy with this morning. And one of the closing topics was what is yoga? And it's like, okay, you know, no, no big deal at all. And, you know, it's interesting because it is all encompassing in so many ways. And I think that's one of the really beautiful things is that it can be different things to you at different times, depending on what you need, because, you know, yoga, you can never know everything. And I think that's something that you learn really quickly. I feel like, you know, you do your true hundred hour and you're like, okay, I'm going to learn this. I'm going to be a yoga teacher. Fantastic. And by the end, you're like, oh my God, I don't know anything. There's no way I can teach this to other people because then you like know enough to know what you don't know, which is mm. so, so much. And I think for many of us, we're initially drawn in through asana, which is amazing. And I absolutely adore that component of the practice. And, but that's kind of like the gateway you know, we come in with the movement and the body and then we start layering in, you know, the breath, our pranayama and feeling more of kind of like the life force of all of that. And then if you're lucky, you know, you're weaving in philosophy, you're weaving in your karma yoga, you've got um, so, so many components. And so I really think it does change and grow with you over time, which is also amazing. And you know, why it can be that, sorry, don't mind Bodhi, he'll be um, in and out. Bodhi's more um, than welcome. Cool. So, you know, I think that's why it can be a lifetime practice and why it doesn't get old, because as you grow and evolve, the practice grows and evolves with you. And it's almost like different components of it open up to you when you're ready for it. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's what helps a lot of people not get bored by it. Absolutely. If, if you're bored with yoga, there's a chance you're just not, you know, you can pick up a different set of glasses, you know, and yeah. just, you know, take a different teacher or go to a different Absolutely. studio and it's infinite. There's, yeah. it's age old and proven true. So. Absolutely. That's awesome. Well, what and is, that's, that's yeah, the thing ahead. too. I was going to say, and that's the thing too, is that it is timeless to a certain degree. Yeah. 
That's very true. When did you first get introduced to yoga? Like your first yeah. class that stuck with you or just your first class yeah, in general? So the first class actually I took with my best friends from high school. It was like our senior year of high school. And so this was the late 90s. So super long time ago before it was kind of cool, if you will. And it's funny, two of the three of us have become yoga teachers since then which is pretty cool. So yeah, that was like the initial through college, you know, I would kind of dabble, go here and there. And um, then in the Detroit area where I landed post-college, I tried a few studios, none of it, it wasn't doing it for me. And um, I spent a year in Evanston, just outside of Chicago. And Chicago has an amazing, really amazing um, yoga community. And, um, I started practicing there and I loved it. And then I was really fortunate when I moved back here, I discovered the studio that I practice at now. I don't know if I'm supposed to mention it or not. So, (laughs) um, um, so it's citizen yoga here in Royal Oak. They've got three studios in Metro Detroit and one down in Cleveland and it's alignment based which just made sense to me and i really really loved like if flow how you feel is your deal totally cool for me having that boundary of alignment really spoke to me in a different way not to mention the teachers are so incredibly knowledgeable you know not only in asana but also when it came to like real philosophical study and soulful messaging like you got so much from every class it was amazing and so that's kind of a really long answer to your question no but that's so good it opens up so Mm -hmm. much you know so how would you say you know for anybody who's curious you know what is alignment (laughs) yoga how would you compare that to something like someone would know maybe vinyasa flow what would you say the difference is right Right. Well, and you can teach alignment in vinyasa, okay. um, which is pretty cool. So alignment, it's about so much of it is about the body fitting into itself and, you know, ensuring that you're aligning your muscles and actually using your muscles, not so much relying on the joints. So that way, you know, the positions are properly aligned and you're, you're doing it so that way you don't because the biggest thing is that you want to have a lifetime practice and you want things to be sustainable. And so, so often it's not about like, you know, cause it's very easy, especially if you are flexible, where all of a sudden you're just like going way too far in a posture. And so it's setting those boundaries. And that's to me, the beauty of it is having that boundary so that you can get more from it which sometimes can seem counterintuitive, but having that boundary actually gives you more instead of takes things away. Yeah, in a way it, it could almost seem like having those boundaries allowed the actual um, development of the muscle groups, right? Versus yeah. the body is, as you know, as, as many mm-hmm. yogis know, the body's so funky and how it compensates um, certain muscle groups. Like if you're weak in the shoulders, it'll, it'll mess mm-hmm. with the way your wrists and your hands right. are positioned and like working on those boundaries and placements allows the strength training to really come into play. For sure. Absolutely. So then, so then how you started, you started yoga senior year in high school and then when yeah. did that, how did that develop from there? You went from. Yeah. So I kind of in and out, I've been practicing consistently for like 13 years now. So ever since I spent some time in Chicago, and then once I came back this way, and um, gosh, I've been back here for like 12 years now, and um, practiced some different places around here, but ultimately landed at Citizen where I practice and teach now, and that's where I did my 200 hour through as well. And um, they've been open here for seven years. And so really things have gotten deeper, if you will, in the last seven years. And I've had, you know, like I said, the opportunity to practice a lot to complete my 200 hour. I'm at the very early stages of working on the 300 hour and have been fortunate enough to get to participate in a few um, retreats. And, you know, like I was saying earlier, all the different components. So you know, practicing the asana and 
doing the philosophical study, you know, doing my reading, doing your work, if you will. And the beautiful thing about where I'm at now is I'm doing it within a supportive community. And to me, that makes all the difference in the world is, you know, you have those other people that, you know, there's a basic understanding while you're all very different, which is amazing, but there are some things, you know, having the studio in common really brings a central focus there. Yeah, totally. I, you know, it's been Mm -hmm. some time since I've been able to regularly practice in a studio, as I'm sure many of, depending on when you listen to this, it can be shared with a lot of the people, but it sounds to me like you've been able to somehow maintain the community, whether it's online yeah. or how has that been for you over the last year, the challenging year mm-hmm. of the COVID year? Right. Well, and I've actually been able to do more. So wow. prior to all things COVID, I was commuting like an hour and a half each way to work most days. And I was doing some traveling as well. And so a lot of times I would practice once I would get home at the studio. Um, But there was so much that I was missing out on because I wasn't here. And um, the studio has been phenomenal about like diving into the online curriculum right away. Like, so we, I'd mentioned philosophy study. We actually have a study group that meets Wednesdays at 7 a.m. and Fridays at 6 a.m. every week. Um, and so, you know, we've been going through different books and sometimes just talking about whatever is happening at that moment and figuring things out. And, you know, the studio was great about diving online and, you know, going into that space while it absolutely does not replace being in person it helped us all get through and now that we're able to slowly start to get in person it's amazing because you know nothing nothing can be the same as actually like hearing someone's breath actually like being near another human you can't get that from this no there's a certain magic that happens in a class where when everyone's devoted to it and maybe maybe for yeah. a moment right it's it's tricky mm-hmm. but maybe for a moment the competition can just kind of fall away and then it's just one right. class breathing together and there's Absolutely. something so transcendental about that moment that mm-hmm. that I, I, sure. I look forward to being able to experience again one day soon yeah but, um, yeah I can relate to that and it's good to have that you know and, and more so that the curriculum the the, the texts to be able to yeah. study in the time because so many Absolutely. of us during quarantine filled our time with netflix and endless facebook mm-hmm. scrolling and those junk food eating habits the things that comfort us right but yeah but being able to focus that in on something maybe that's a little bit more spiritually right. in tune and then share for sure it just, wow well, and I tend to be a little on the intense side when it's very interesting. So I've been doing a lot of reflecting since we're like a year out from everything. And March 1st of 2020, I had started journaling again. I go in and out of journaling. Sometimes I'm great. Sometimes meh, not basically when things are really good, not journaling. <laughs> when things are a disaster, there's it's all documented. <laughs> But it was interesting because March 1st, before everything happened, I had journaled about feeling disconnected, about wanting to be more intentional about my philosophical study, about being more intentional about my practice, being more intentional about taking care of myself, basically. And so sorry if I brought COVID on us. <laughs> <laughs> it's all your fault. You're the blame. It's, Finally. It's all my fault. <laughs> Found <know>. the blame. <laughs> I know. So given what I thought as the gift of time to not be spending 12 plus hours a week commuting, to not be traveling around the country, you know, to really be able to focus, like I was all in as soon as Um, my studio was like, okay, we're going to start the philosophy study. And we've got like, I was practicing every day and I was doing the studying, you know, because I'm like, okay, this is awesome. This is like an elongated yoga retreat without an amazing location. Um, And two, you know, initially 
it was like, oh, this is going to last two weeks. So it's like, I'm going to get everything I can out of this two weeks. And, you know, so me being the type A, sometimes intense person that I was, I'm like, I'm going to fix my entire life. (laughs) And, you know, was doing my personal work. And at the time I had a partner. So also it's like, okay, great. Like we can fix any of our communication issues. We can work on our finances because we're not going out and doing anything. You know, we can make food at home. We're both at home so we can spend more time together. This will be great. I naively said. Yeah, I hear, I hear you saying, (laughs) you're setting it, you're definitely setting the tempo up. So, so then what happened? What happened to that? Yes. Through 2020 for so you and your then, partner? yeah. So while I was having all of these feelings and frankly, like kind of hope and excitement in a weird way, because don't get me wrong, I also was very aware of what was going on and terrifying and obviously did not anyone to get sick, did not anyone want anyone to die, like didn't want to bring any of the bad things on, but it was like, okay, you know, I'm quarantining, so I'm going to be doing the thing. So I'm going to make the best of this. And also that's my, you know, naturally optimistic (laughs) side of me. Um, Meanwhile, my husband at the time was like, "Mm, yeah, I don't think I'm meant to be married. And I'm like, okay, well, because you are married and uh, this was your idea. Like, don't get me wrong. I said, yes, but wait a second here. So while I was in the space of like, make everything in life better, how are we going to like level up and, you know, really be ready to, you know, put ourselves in a great place financially to put ourselves in a great place to start a family. Like this is such a good opportunity. And he's like, yeah, I want out basically. And um, so that came up through, we'd been seeing a therapist for a while at that point, it had been more about kind of like external family things, some internal things. And um, so then it was kind of like, okay, what do you want out of life? And so then all of a sudden, you know, we're having these big convers revisiting big conversations, because of course, before we got married, we had the, you know, what do you want out of life conversations, but the thing is, it changed for him. And ultimately, um, through what ended up taking almost six months, um, was that ultimately he decided he wanted a very different life that he didn't want to be married. He didn't want to have to answer to anyone. Not that I'm a restrictive person in any way. Like if anything, he's like, I was able to stay married to you for so long because of who you are, because you are so like, Hey, you do you. Um, but ultimately he knew that he was doing me a disservice because he couldn't, commit to the same level of self-work and commitment and really like for me like I want to get everything that I can out of life and so for me that looks like continued work and growth and for him um from what he shared obviously I can't speak for him um but he's kind of like in the work hard play hard mode of like I want to do my work, but then I just want to do whatever I want to, whenever I want to. And and that's it. And so that looked very different from a value purpose driven life. And while it's incredibly painful and I'm good with, you know, him, I've actually like forgiven him. He knows I've forgiven him. And, um, you know, this isn't where I want to be but I can appreciate that he, you know, made, I guess the grown up decision of, um, I can't give you what you deserve. And for me, it was really hard to be like, well, yes, you can, you can, you just don't want to, but that's the thing. Cause it's, it's hard work to, you know, live that value purpose driven life. It's a constant commitment and decision. It is, maybe a lot easier to just kind of work and do whatever's fun at the moment and then kind of go from there. Yeah. And I hear you and I know that you're doing such a beautiful job at sharing. And so thank you for opening up, but I know that it's not easy, you know, no, that's something that we both share in this moment. We 
you know, with, with differences, of course, we both of are course. experiencing our own, our own form of this coming to believe, coming to terms of what is and being mm -hmm. able to, or working on being able to differentiate what we held on to, what we thought we wanted versus yeah. what it actually intended for us. And that's a tough, really it tough is. thing to come to. How would you say your studies and your community mm -hmm. and your yoga and your experience in that, how would you say that has helped you through mm -hmm. this phase of transition in your life? Um, sometimes as simple as the gift of not thinking about it for maybe if I'm lucky an hour here and there. So um, I've been teaching regularly for almost a year and a half now. Um, but starting the summer, I was able to start teaching more and especially more into the fall and kind of ebbed and flowed depending on um, what was happening with quarantine and whatnot. But initially, because and I think especially because I'm a newer teacher, for the hour that you're teaching, you can't think about whatever disaster is happening in your life. You have to focus on because you're talking for an hour. It's very rarely a two-way conversation outside of, of course, people are communicating with their bodies and their breaths. Yes. But, you know, by and large, you know, you've got to really be on for that hour. So initially, that would be the only time I wasn't thinking about it. And so the teaching component was amazing, not to mention that also feels like I'm um, – supporting my purpose and fulfilling my purpose in some way because I can go into it more but you know one of the big things through the loss of the relationship was losing my purpose and losing that intended path so definitely the purpose in teaching and then as far as study it's a double-edged sword because you know you kind of learn how you want to feel you learn how you want to trust um, that things are working out as they're intended to, and you want to believe and trust that what you're going through is for something and that you're doing this to grow in some way. So you want to like feel all of those things, which sometimes you can, sometimes you can, it really depends. And, you know, sometimes it's as simple and maybe it's just for a short period where you're like, you know what? yes, you know, I'm, I'm good with this. Like I need to be present. I need to be with my breath. I'm okay right now. And I can be okay with that. I need to get my mind out of the future or out of the past, depending on where you're at at that moment. So having those tools are beautiful, but like I said, it's, it can go back and forth because it's like, you know, better, but that doesn't, your mind doesn't always, always catch up there. And then the practice itself, of course, can really help you know your body your mind but also sometimes it can be can be a little much this is my second divorce and it was interesting the first divorce it took me six months before I could practice practice was too much for me I was just running because I literally needed to like run my mind out and if I got to my mat basically I would just cry the whole time and I was like well this isn't productive so it took me a while. So I'm grateful. And obviously I'm different, but I've been able to practice throughout and have definitely relied on that. So I kind of went all over the place, but that's what I tend to do. Comprehensively yeah. answering. Yeah, no, that's, it's good because it allows it to just kind of flow and it allows, mm -hmm. you know, your words to really carry the weight of your heart. Right. And it allows yeah. you to speak to the heart of many who may be dealing with challenges because it, we're, we're going through a time and for the last year, literally yeah. almost a year to the day, I think it was mm -hmm. a year, 365 days ago today, yeah. the world kind of officially was like, hold up, sums up, you know? Right. Absolutely. March 10th, 2021 in this now moment. And so it's been challenging, but I want to take a step back and, and, yeah. and hear, ask you a little bit perhaps on... Mm -hmm to elaborate on what you meant by losing your purpose through yeah. the separation of the relationship. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you, would you say that your purpose, well, let me ask you, what would you say your purpose yeah. was 365 days ago? Mm -hmm. Well, I had gotten to the point. So 
I've mentioned, type A driven. Um, and I was very career focused for a long time. And, um, and also just always working on something because I had my career stuff, but then also, you know, like I knew I wanted to get my master's degree. I did that. I knew that I, you know, even teacher training, I wanted to run a half marathon. Like I always, in addition to my work intensity at times, I also had kind of my side projects as well. So always, you know, achieving very, very achievement focused. And I would go back and forth on the family thing because I wanted to have a family or I thought that I did, but I also was never one of those women that's like, yes, I've been called to do this. I know that I want children. I must do this. Otherwise I am not fulfilled. I never had that clarity, which I was kind of jealous of to a certain degree. And also I've always had this feeling of responsibility of, I have all of these amazing opportunities. So I need to make the most of my life because not all women have these opportunities. And it put that pressure on myself. And to a certain degree, it was almost like if I became a mother too soon, that I wouldn't be able to achieve what I needed to achieve before I kind of like rescinded into my family and my home. Also, all in my head. Um, hold on, I, but hold on. Let me yeah. stop you there because yeah. it's in your head, yet intuitively perhaps we mm -hmm. can use that word because they're very yeah. different being in your head and being intuitively in your gut perhaps or your heart space. right mm -hmm. you find yourself maybe in this situation where you're still being given the opportunity to define yourself and your purpose before right. that phase of your life comes right right hopefully i don't know i just turned 40 this year so or last year oh, um yes. so you know biology yay for women <laughs> so um sorry I got I lost myself for a second so you know I put all these pressures on myself and I finally hit that point where it's like you know what I am ready to kind of make those sacrifices because also I didn't want to have a child and not be around and so it was kind of like figuring out what would, what would life look like. And so I finally reached a point. I was turning 40 in May of 2020. Um, it was lovely. My um, ex-husband was supposed to be taking me to Paris. He'd surprised me with this amazing potential trip with some close friends. And it was to be just the best thing ever. I'd wanted to go since I was in high school had never been was like a big, big deal. And so, you know, the thought was go to Paris, try to get pregnant, see what happens. So for me, the end of 2020 was supposed to be, had gone on this amazing trip, had this amazing life experience, and then was like really ready to kind of start the next phase of life looking, you know, beyond myself and beyond just my partner and I. Um, and so that obviously did not happen. <laughs> and so it's, and I've been working through, I mean, because so that being said, I really wanted, you know, this strong partnership where we were growing as individuals and growing together. I, you know, had a desire to have a beautiful home that we were building together. And then ultimately to have a family and, you know, build our own traditions and, you know, kind of live life in that more traditional way, if you will. And then I guess the universe laughed at me. Um, and I can like laugh and smile at the moment. Sometimes I'm good with it. Some, well, I don't know if I'm ever good with it. Sometimes I can accept that that's where I'm at other times, not so much at all. Um, but the biggest thing is like knowing I can still potentially have those things. They just might look differently than I expected them to. And so it's, it's figuring that out and, you know, it's hard to be other to like, obviously not everyone has those things, but you know, here in suburban Detroit, my closest friends have those things and it's, it's hard to be the person who doesn't when you, you would like those things too. And I'm not saying that 
their lives are perfect and without challenges. We all have our challenges, but you know, it's, it's, it's a tough thing. And of course it's all about perspective. You can also see it as, you know, the opportunity to define yourself and to lead a life that's different, but when you don't want to be, it can be kind of tough. Yeah. There's that resistance. And I, you know, I can hear your higher self coming in and, and you know, these things, you know, we read about these yeah. things and we talk about these things in yoga philosophy and these Dharma right. talks and these books. It's all about just trusting, just trusting, mm-hmm. just trusting, even blindly. Right. Yeah. But how challenging that is when we reach a point where we are so sure, so certain of what we right. want. Right. It's yeah. It's really challenging. So how would you say you define your balance between feeling and trusting? Mm -hmm. Um, It depends on the moment. (laughs) I've never been an anxiety person. Anxiety is something I've really only developed um, over the course of both of my divorces. Um, And I think because it is because being pushed so far into uncertainty and lack of control um, that creates that. And so if I'm in a place where I feel pretty even with things, then I can be in that trusting space. But when I'm going too much into the future, attaching too much to what I want, then I definitely get into, you know, the space, the space you don't want to be in. And you know, then it's just trying to pull yourself out. And, um, you know, so much of that can be done through therapy, through the practice. Acupuncture, I've also found to be a really great tool, but it doesn't, you know, it's, it's riding the wave. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, you know, day by day, hour by hour, even some days. Um, Right. I understand. I understand. I really well, do. And it's it. tough because it's a spiral, you know, as we've heard and said a million times, healing's not linear, which is so tough because you want to like get through that phase to move into whatever's next. And, you know, you'll even have maybe a period of time where it's like, cool, like, this is good. I'm totally good with this. And then all of a sudden you're not again. And so going through that is, is a whole nother process. Have you found any methods of approach? Are there any things that you do uh, mm-hmm. maybe when you feel or, or sense those thoughts coming back up yeah. on, that, on that path, you know? Right. Yeah. I try to like recognize and accept them to a certain degree and sometimes to like feel the feeling. So if I need to cry, I need to cry. Um, I had reference running that can be therapeutic at times and hasn't been unfortunately lately um but hopefully that'll come back and sometimes it's you know revisiting my past journals of not only the affirmations and kind of the knowings but also okay like this is what I'm remembering this is what I remember being you know three months ago six months ago what was it really like and so then sometimes seeing kind of how far you've come, even though you still aren't where you want to be, you are in a better place. If nothing else, you're continuing to hone more tools and to be able to cope in a different way. Cause no matter, no matter what, you're a different person now than you were maybe even a week ago. Absolutely. And that growth, it's so exponential, right? When we're put yeah. in those growing pains, we just really mm-hmm. begin to soar. You know, it's not like we, it's not like we want to, ideally we would right. want the situations that lead no. to it, but we fly nonetheless because yeah. we know we have to. Yeah. And then the other thing that I forgot to mention is, you know, having your people, your community and, you know, you over time figure out, you know, you have different people for different things. You have some people that you know you can text that will be helpful. You have some people that you know a phone call will be helpful. You know, some people, if you're lucky enough, face-to-face. But, you know, figuring out those key people who can help you, because that's the biggest thing is you can't and don't have to do it on your own, um, which is, that's something I very much learned the first time that I went through a divorce is that you have to be okay with the 
with being the person who needs help, which I hate. <laughs> I'd much rather be the helper than the person that needs help. And, but luckily, you know, coming through it this time, I already knew that. And I had learned that lesson well. And it's like, okay, here we go. Like, hi, help me. <laughs> you, were, you were ready and you, you understood. Right. How, mm -hmm. how has your personal practice changed? I know you teach a good bit. You yeah. spend a lot of your week teaching now because of your, your freedom. But how, do you have much of a personal practice at this time? And what does yeah. that look like uh, over the last year? Absolutely. Um, so as far as like me practicing totally by myself, that doesn't happen a whole lot. If anything, it'll just be a few flows here and there as I'm, you know, kind of putting together a class or if I want to work through some different ideas just to see how that feels and if it truly makes sense. Um, but I do practice a lot with my teachers. Um, and that has been so, so important because also that's one of those times where you can actually just be in the present and you're not worrying about anything else. And, you know, you can have that gift of really joy and freedom because that's the biggest thing is, you know, the more that we can be in the present, the less we torture ourselves. And for me, practice you know, practicing as a student, that's one of the best ways to make that happen. I love that. It's almost very mm -hmm. humbling too, to, to always, yeah. be, there's more to learn. And absolutely. Oh my gosh. Always there, you know, and it's funny because, um, I know that my practice is far stronger than it was a year ago, but oh my gosh, there's still so many things that it's like, well, I want to be able to do this better. I want to continue to grow this. Like I still feel really inflexible there. I don't feel strong enough here. Um, and obviously those are silly, silly things. But for me, the biggest thing and how I, if you were to measure um, kind of the success of the practice is staying with the breath and staying on the mat and being present. It doesn't matter if, you know, my headstand went well that day, or, you know, yes, if I actually hit yes. handstand for two seconds, that's not what's, in, what's important. What matters is if I was able to actually be in the practice for an hour. Absolutely. And I can, mm -hmm. like, thank you for stressing that. Thank you for You're saying welcome. that because that's so, that's yoga mm -hmm. showing up Absolutely. on the mornings when you're so weak and you don't want to, right. I mean, feel your thing, do your thing, use your mm -hmm. internal discernment to, yeah. to maybe allow yourself to take a day off, but know yeah. that, know that you can always rest after the class and at least show up for yourself at a time where yeah. it's so tough to, I'm going to use the word I don't normally use, expect others to show up. You know, that, right. whole, that whole language is very, can be detrimental to, mm -hmm. can lead to so much suffering as the Buddha said himself. Yeah. But learning how to use that and show up for yourself despite mm -hmm. the situation and as, a, as a moment of self-love. Look at it as if you're taking yeah. a bath or you're yeah. getting your nails done, if that's your thing or something. You right. know what I mean? It's a, it can be the yeah. same level of self-love. Right. Well, and for me, it's right up there with, eating like it honestly it's something that I need in my life right now which I'm I'm practicing in one way or another daily that works for me I'm not saying that that's for everyone but you know I know that I need that to continue to work through things and I've been really intentional about doing different things and especially as a new teacher I think it's important to you know practice with teachers you might not know well or you know, practice different styles and whatnot. So that way you're continuing to grow and evolve in that way too. But, you know, being really intentional, like, you know, tonight after my regular work, um, I'll be teaching two classes this evening and then I'll be going back to the studio to take a restorative class with a teacher who I adore because I know that I'll feel so much better. Like it just, it makes, it makes a difference. And it's having that knowing and to your point like kind of not giving yourself excuses like for me practice is one of my non-negotiables that's just part of what I need and 
give yourself a pat on the back for knowing that. <laughs> I mean, that is, a, if that's not, you know, transformative understanding, I don't know. Right. I don't know what is. So yeah. earlier I asked what your purpose was 365 days ago and you had a beautiful <laughs> answer. Now I want to know what is your purpose now? What would you say is your purpose? If you Right. So it's complicated. I'm still working through it. So I've got my values. So that's a good, a good, a good starting point. So I've got my values down and I'm still working on purpose. So for me, you know, from a work perspective for gosh, over a decade now, I'm a major gifts fundraiser and education is incredibly important to me. I received um, a few scholarships as an undergrad, and that's kind of was my entry point into philanthropy of like learning, learning that. And for me, I've always believed that education can transform your life. I know for me, it's personally transformed my life. And my work purpose has been very wrapped in that. I worked for my sororities foundation for eight years, which was in an organization that absolutely changed my life. I now work for my alma mater and um, do fundraising there as well, which also equally changed my life. So I've been very purpose driven when it comes to work. And then, you know, I had the purpose was kind of the work part was still obviously going to be there, but also purpose more toward, you know, family and whatnot. And, um, you know, obviously teaching yoga is a big component of education because it's funny growing up, I, I wanted to be a teacher. I thought that's what I was going to do. I think part of it was too, that I didn't know what my other options were wrapped with some sort of calling. And it's funny, um, talking with one of my mentors in the last year, um, I didn't really, I hadn't thought about it this way, but she's like, well, yeah, you're struggling with all this because you're a caretaker and you don't have anybody to take care of, but yourself. And I'm like, Oh, I never, I guess, because I don't have children. I never seen myself as a caretaker. But once she said that, I was like, Oh, you're right. (laughs) Because both of my ex-husbands, I took care of, you know, not necessarily intentionally. It's just what happened and you have some purpose in that. And so really long answer of, I haven't figured it out yet. I know part of it is definitely education focused. Part of it is definitely spiritual growth. And I just don't really know what that looks like yet, but very much I want to figure out purpose and kind of like my life's mission. It's, you know, small things to figure out. At the same time, you need to have that recognition and knowledge, you know, to once again, be purposeful. Yeah. And you're so spot on with that. It's not a, it's not about knowing these answers, but it, you know, if nothing else, a direction. And, right. And maybe a direction is to be able to take that innate mm-hmm. subconscious caretaking desire and and yeah. learn what it finally means to give that to you i'm sure you've been exposed mm-hmm. to that teaching over the last year quite heavily right. but there's still mm-hmm. so much magic in the repetition of the understanding yes absolutely well it's interesting so i had mentioned working with a therapist and earlier this year um she's like i don't give this advice very often but she's like you need to stop doing so much self work and i'm like what do you mean? Oh, <laughs> like, what? Self-work is like, lo- yes. <laughs> I'm like, you're, what are you talking about? She's like, no more journaling, no more reading. Like you need to just be. And I'm like, no, <laughs> like, don't make me just sit with myself. This is not cool. <laughs> yeah, that can be tough. And so that. that's, you know, finding not that we can ever find like balance. I, that's, it is what it is, but finding, um, I guess, kind of a productive, make, making sure that you're doing things in the most beneficial way for yourself because self work for the, you know, for me, it's like, okay, I don't want to be in the space. I'm going to do all the work that I need to, to get out of this space. And I think, unfortunately, 
part of it is being in the space for a minute. Yeah, and that's it's just not very pleasant. But no, each day no. brings its own set of challenges and victories. Yeah. You know, and I think that a lot mm -hmm. of people can relate to that. I want to I wanna turn, I like to offer any listeners the ability mm -hmm. to dive a little bit deeper in their practice. And obviously everyone's practice is different. Everyone's path is mm -hmm. different. But what's beautiful is what has led us each individually to our current place, right? I'm not going to use the word mm -hmm. destination to our current right. place because there's no destination in this journey. No. You know this. But what are some of the tools, teachings, maybe some of the books or mm -hmm. guides, anyone, anything that comes to your mind that has really kind of helped encourage you along this path? Mm -hmm. um, so with uh, the studio that I work with, we study Vedanta. Um, and I really enjoy studying that philosophy, been studying some Buddhism as well. But that's what's kind of cool is like you pull from the different traditions and then you see the commonalities because it's not about being dogmatic. It's not about there's only one way to look at things, which I always really appreciate. I grew up Catholic, went to Catholic high school, but was very fortunate that um in my religious learnings, we actually were exposed to different things. It wasn't just learning about Catholicism. And so from even a younger age than that, I had always seen that there are these different ways of looking at the world because different people need different things. And that's something that I've kind of always appreciated. Um, but in the last six months, I've been reading on studying Good Citizens by um, Thich Nhat Hanh it has been amazing. Absolutely adore that book. And, you know, so much of it, it's about making conscious choices and working from a community standpoint and, you know, being really intentional about your thoughts, about your actions and doing everything you can to make that next right action. And if you're doing that, paired with having faith that you're, you know, headed in the right direction is really, really powerful. And um, that's kind of like what I've been studying lately. And this week specifically, I've really, you know, from my own teaching, you know, I've been doing my own reflecting, but then what I've been talking about this week in class, which is way easier said than done, and I'm also trying to sell myself on this is not pegging your present happiness on future acquisition. Say that, say that again for me. Say that again. Not peg your present happiness on future acquisition. And what does that mean to you? So to me, that means number one, being present, not just, you know, living in the future. And also it's great to have goals, have your goals, totally cool but be okay with where you're at now and give yourself the space to ha have little bits of joy as you're going along. Because if just everything is based on the goal of having a partner, the goal of having a home, you know, a beautiful home, the goal of having that next promotion, even as simple as it's spring. So now we're, some of us are thinking fashion things, the goal of like that bag or those shoes that you want, like, allow yourself to be happy now because also for many of us you feel like you have to earn happiness like you need to work hard you need to get that thing and then you can be happy and obviously once again cheesy happiness not being a destination but figuring out how you can enjoy those bits of joy and freedom ultimately through presence on a daily basis well said. I love it. I love all of that. It's, it is so important to be reminded of these teachings and, and yeah. how they apply to us in our own personal day-to-day -day life and what current experience right. we're going through. And it's been so nice to just have you on here and help shed light mm -hmm. about the realness of life. You know, so many yoga mm -hmm. teachers will just drink their green juice and, hey, I love green juice. They'll just, they'll just do their thing and they'll just pretend like life is beautiful and grand. And for some, mm -hmm. that is their fortune and for some that is their their thing but you know right. i think i think for a select few of others or maybe even a, a larger population who knows um the toughness of life can provide mm -hmm. the lessons that are not easy but are, are 
very much necessary at helping others to also find that same distinction and purpose and what it means and then understanding what happiness means and these big questions mm -hmm. you know it's easy when like you said about journaling earlier when, when everything's going good it's it's so easy to not focus on that yeah. self-love but Absolutely. developing these practices and knowing that they're there for you when you're both at your best and at your worst can help you mm -hmm. you know with each single step of the day live a more balanced life and there's just absolutely well that. yeah well and knowing we're, life is about challenges like things like the pro yes we have problems now guess what we're gonna have problems next year too they're just different and so so much of it you know not to sound like that hippie green juice loving happy yogi Do it. <laughs> um but it's about choosing to be happy and to see things from a positive light, choosing that brightness, you know, knowing that you have a bright light within yourself and choosing that is, yeah, everything can totally suck if you want it to. And that doesn't take away from things that are difficult. You know, we all go through things that are difficult to your point. Some people's difficulties are way more difficult than others, but also it, it's all relative on our, based on our experiences. But at the end of the day, it depends on your choice of how you're going to deal with it. And, you know, knowing that you will never kind of hit that point of like zero problems because that's just not the human experience. So it comes down to your choice and how you want to um, move through the world and how you want to, the relationship that you have with yourself as well as others. Yeah, well said, that discernment and that understanding. I want yeah. to ask you, what does your shirt mean to you? I, I like the sun, and is it a 3 Oh, thanks. Um, so, yeah, it's, it says ascending soul. Ascending soul. And, yeah, so there is the sun, the lovers, and the star, and it just, like, really spoke to me. It's funny, my girlfriend and I were out shopping, and I was in Arizona, and we were shopping together, and I'm like, I really like that. She's like, yeah, that's totally you. And I was like, yes, I just, it just felt right. Yes, it definitely is you <laughs> embodied. And I'm glad you wore it today. It's perfect. Awesome. So in closing out today, I want to say just truly, truly, without words even coming close, just how grateful I am for your light in this world and for what it means to be you and to wake up every day and to still shine that light and show up for yourself. It's it's a beautiful thing to witness and I'm honored to call you a friend and I'm so grateful that our paths have crossed. I want to open up the floor to you to say anything directly that may come through any of your channels to anybody anywhere mm -hmm. right now. Yeah, I think that, well, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to join you. I'm incredibly grateful for you as well. And I think that that, you know, part of the thing is you find those silver linings. I probably would not be here talking to you if things had gone how I planned, if you will. Maybe I would be. I don't, I don't know. Um, but I think it comes back to, once again, way easier said than done, but having faith that we're on the right path that we will continue to learn to grow and evolve and that you know we have to do these hard things sometimes in order to reach those next levels if you will and you know even though it's incredibly difficult and really painful at times you know taking that next right action and you know being as positive as you can and working to be present. I realize I'm just like throwing all of those like kind of buzz terms out there. But when you're able to actually implement that into your daily modern life, it makes a, all the difference in the world. And you know what, it might just be for a few seconds here or there, but when you do it makes it makes it worthwhile. Absolutely. And I definitely feel like we could talk for hours know, right? <laughs> and hours because you, you got such a beautiful way of putting in these these very novel concepts into very um, simple and digestible ways for people to uh -huh. come as they are and and mm -hmm. you know begin to absorb them so 
thank you truly for sharing and being here and um it's an honor and let's let's look at having you back on here sometime in the next couple months and touch and base and seeing uh, what your purpose means to you at that point too yes i hope to have it more figured out then we'll see (laughs) fingers crossed i'm i'm working on it i'm doing the work yes you are and you're also carrying that love so Mm -hmm. thank you melissa for being here hey everybody really hope you enjoyed that talk it was beautiful to have that experience with that shared guest we have a lot of very useful information in the description section below so be sure to check it out i've also linked any and all videos with that individual in the description below so check those out as well it's an honor to bring this footage to you and i hope you can come back and continue to deepen your practice namaste